with. So these are a broad family of viruses that are actually named after their um, microscopic appearance, a corona, it looks like a crown. And there are, um, you know, again, dozens of these. There's a few of them that are known to infect humans that largely cause uh, relatively mild upper respiratory disease or common cold. And then more recently, we've had outbreaks of um, coronaviruses that can cause severe lower respiratory tract disease uh, or pneumonia. So um, the first of these that we became acquainted with, you might remember, your viewers might remember SARS that also came out of China back in 2003. More recently, we've had MERS, which is known as the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome virus, which is coming out of the Arabian Peninsula. So now this is the third kind of novel coronavirus that we're having experience with that can cause severe lower respiratory tract disease. These typically spread from uh, person to person via large droplets, respiratory droplets, so when somebody coughs or sneezes, it can uh, be transmissible that way. There were reports that this started at a food market. It is not a foodborne illness, though. This is something that's spread just via the air. Correct. So uh, many of these coronaviruses have a natural reservoir in animals, and so we know that in certain instances they've been able to infect camels or cats or bats. And um, the original descriptions of this new coronavirus coming out of China to a food market where they had uh, live animals that they would sell. So the hypothesis is that there may be an animal reservoir that is now transferred into humans. So there has been at least one case uh, here in the U.S., someone that had traveled to that area of China. What is your message to people here? I mean, how concerned do people need to be about this virus? So maybe I'll turn to uh, Dr. Lawler, who's our expert on uh, global health security, and he might be appropriate to answer that question. So I think right now the, the risk in the United States and in most countries outside of China is very low. The, the outbreak really seems to be concentrated in, in the city of Wuhan, uh, which is in uh, kind of central eastern China. Um, and in, in the U.S., we should probably be much more worried about influenza and respiratory diseases that uh, we know cause significant uh, morbidity and mortality every year. So on an average year, 30,000 Americans die of influenza. Um, so we've had one detected case of this new coronavirus in the U.S. So I, I think it's, it's appropriate for folks to, to temper their, their alarm. But it is, I think, reason to be aware that uh, we are uh, vulnerable to emerging infections uh, anywhere in the world. With modern transportation, you can be uh, anywhere in the globe in 24 hours. And so, um, you know, I, th I think the good thing is it highlights that we've become much better at detecting uh, you know, these types of events, our uh, surveillance is much better than it was even in 2003 with SARS. And I think the fact that uh, just a couple of weeks into the outbreak, we have a much better idea of what the pathogen is. Um, we have systems already in place that are doing uh, surveillance and, uh, and detection and tracking. And so I think we're well ahead of uh, where we have been with previous outbreaks. But, but again, this is uh, unfortunately something that's going to continue to happen. Uh, new and emerging diseases are uh, uh, are not going to stop anytime soon. Can you talk a little bit about would uh, Nebraska Medicine have any role the biocontainment unit in responding to this, particularly if it continues to grow? Angela, why don't you take that uh, as our director of the mm -hmm. biocontainment unit? Sure. So yes, uh, we, we definitely in the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit follow this and any other outbreak going on in the world very closely. And I do feel like that in our role as a biocontainment unit and also um, you know, as one of the leaders in, in the United States in biocontainment, that we should not only be monitoring this closely, but also serving as an example for others um, as far as doing appropriate travel screening here at Nebraska Medicine, making sure that when people come to our emergency department or our clinics that we're asking that question, have you traveled somewhere outside the United States? Not necessarily just for, for this virus that we're discussing, but for other, other pathogens as well. There are other outbreaks going on in the world as well. Um, but yes, in the biocontainment unit, I, I do feel like that we should serve in that leadership role and to provide that guidance for others um, in their, their infection control management of these type of pathogens. You talked a little bit about the change in response to uh, these these kinds of illnesses as compared to SARS 15 years ago, I suppose. Um, 
can you expand on that a little bit and talk about what the global response looks like in terms of containing this type of outbreak um, and treating it if that's something that's occurring? Sure. I, I think overall this response has been much quicker uh, and um, much more open and transparent than what happened in 2003 with SARS. So uh, SARS was um, going on and there were cases that were popping up in hospitals and transmission was occurring for months uh, before anybody really became aware of it um, outside of uh, you know the, the local endemic region. Uh, and then it, it took quite a while to, uh, to identify what the virus was and to implement appropriate um, travel screening and precautions and by that time you know, the virus had escaped and was in Hong Kong, was in Singapore, was in Vietnam, ended up in Canada. And so you really had a worldwide outbreak at that point. Hopefully, so far, uh, we seem to have done a much better job of identifying uh, cases and uh, implementing the appropriate public health measures to prevent spread. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the Chinese government has actually been uh, very transparent and open about uh, sharing the status of the outbreak and uh, identified and, and notified partners in the World Health Organization very quickly. Uh, the WHO is apparently meeting to discuss um, whether this should be declared a public health emergency of international uh, consequence. Um, you know, I think at this point, uh, most experts predict that that will not happen. That. Uh, the WHO will be satisfied with the status of response right now and the fact that uh, this appears to be, you know, so far uh, relatively confined except for, uh, you know, a few cases that have kind of uh, gotten out on, on airplanes. And so um, I think overall it does demonstrate that the world has made significant progress in um, combating um, these types of emerging disease threats. And if I could elaborate just a little bit on that, um, clearly here in the United States uh, we're being very proactive. So travelers from Wuhan, China are actually being uh, funneled into five airports in the U.S. now where they are being screened uh, for any kind of respiratory or febrile illness. If they were um, discovered, they would be observed carefully in quarantine. Um, similarly, they're being given information that if they arrive here and then become ill, that they should seek a medical attention and obviously alert medical personnel that they've been potentially exposed in Wuhan. So um, we're very much ahead of the ball game as opposed to where we were uh, years ago and are being very proactive with this. Here at Nebraska Medicine, as Dr. Hewlett mentioned, we clearly have already put in uh, travel screening for people coming into our clinics and emergency department. We have the biocontainment unit uh, on alert if we, uh, if we needed them. One question that we've heard on staff here is people locally have had children or friends or known people who have been diagnosed with coronavirus, and it's confusing to them. They hear the word, and they think it's the same thing. Can you explain the differences there? Yeah, so um, clearly the coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that cause everything from the common cold, which is what you're referring to, to more severe lower respiratory tract disease, which is what these newer uh, novel coronaviruses are sometimes associated with. Uh, we're particularly concerned with these novel coronaviruses and other coronaviruses sometimes in very uh, immunosuppressed hosts. And so sometimes they can cause more severe disease, even the more common coronaviruses, in our bone marrow transplant patients or somebody who is immunosuppressed or the very young or the very old. So, um, you know, we do have a, a wealth of experience with coronaviruses in general and uh, are learning more about this new one uh, as days go by. There's a chance that that could happen. We, you know, as Dr. Brutt mentioned, we are travel screening. And if we did have a person who presented to our emergency department um, or to our clinics that had an appropriate travel history and also appropriate symptoms, then we would consider bringing them into the biocontainment unit, mainly for diagnosis and then appropriate monitoring and, and, um, and supportive care. Uh, you know, we do serve as, um, as a, a leader both in our, our region and the United States. Uh, there's a chance that if there were a patient that were infected with this illness in our region as well, um, that, with, that we could care for them in the unit also. And we do stand ready for this and any other pathogen. Um, last question I think I have is, I know that you, we don't want to be alarmist because the flu is a larger threat for people here in the U.S., but um, 
if people have travel plans to go to some of these locations where the disease has been detected, I mean, what are the symptoms or what should people be aware of? Is there any, any sort of message of what people should be looking out for? So the CDC has um, issued a fairly low-level alert for people traveling to that specific part of China that they should be careful, uh, avoid sick people, um, you know, just some common sense sort of precautions. Uh, again, the coronavirus has generally caused kind of a febrile flu-like illness, and so it could be uh, easily confused with, uh, you know, much more common viruses that we're seeing. And as Dr. Lawler mentioned, I think that it's important for viewers to keep this in perspective, that, uh, you know, we currently have uh, widely circulating a virus, influenza, that uh, causes anywhere from 25,000 to 50,000 deaths per year in our country every year. Um, and so we need to be, you know, making sure that we're taking appropriate precautions to prevent the spread of those viruses while being on lookout for this novel coronavirus at the same time. We have a question from a reporter online uh, asking how, if we are currently working with the CDC, and WHO and monitoring or preparing for the coronavirus, does the Global Center for Health Security play a role? Sure, so the, the Global Center for Health Security is involved um, in long-standing programs to, uh, to help train uh, first responders and other uh, healthcare workers uh, in appropriate infection prevention and control. We work very closely with our biocontainment unit colleagues and also with uh, folks here at the university and uh, at the hospital who are part of the uh, Ebola Treatment and Education Center, uh, which is the main resource uh, for training hospitals across the nation in appropriate infection prevention and control. And so, um, you know, all of those efforts together really over, over years have uh, done a significant amount to uh, increase preparedness uh, in hospitals to manage these types of uh, highly dangerous pathogens. That's another advantage that we have over 2003 is that after Ebola and with the advent of, of NETEC and other efforts, um, we've, we've done a much better job of preparing hospitals to manage uh, patients with uh, potentially highly infectious diseases and um, that's, uh, that's a real resource that uh, I think could be relied on and will uh, significantly improve our ability to manage, uh, you know, an outbreak beyond one or two patients if that's, uh, if that's what occurs. How is it uh, something like this different than a, an Ebola type situation where you um, have such high levels of travel as compared to not seeing that as much in Western Africa with the Ebola? Well, China is a, a very common travel destination, um, both for, you know, for business travelers as well as for, um, for people going on vacation. And so we don't see quite as much travel to those areas affected by Ebola and the Democratic Republic of Congo, namely currently, um, as we do to China, which is a, a very common travel destination. So that is one, you know, one difference about Ebola versus this outbreak uh, is that you know there, there are a lot more travelers returning to the U.S. and to other places uh, from China than from the affected area in the Congo. The other thing I would point out is that the lethality of these diseases differ very markedly with Ebola being associated with a much higher rate of fatality than the coronavirus infection. Uh, currently we have a handful of deaths due to coronavirus in China. Uh, it appears to be less transmissible and less severe, perhaps, than SARS or even MERS. So uh, we have um, that uh, to our advantage as well. Is there a way to compare uh, how transmissible this might be compared to the flu that we're experiencing and how um, lethal it might be compared to flu? <laughs> We've had several deaths in the area. Uh, we have flu already. Correct, and that's why I think that it's so important for people to keep those things in perspective, that uh, we're dealing with um, very minimal risk right now from this coronavirus where we're dealing with a much higher level of risk from very common viruses that we are used to encountering uh, each and every year. Anyone have anything else? Okay, great. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.